My name is Megan Matthews. I am an intern here at The Well, and it is my joy to be bringing you this Advent message today. I love the Bible, and I love uh, being able to talk about it. Uh, but first, before we actually get into scripture, I want to start by telling you a story. So I didn't grow up in a religious family, but I did grow up in a family that was very into Christmas. And when I say that we were very into Christmas, I'm talking we had eight, maybe even 10 of those huge Rubbermaid bins that lived in our basement and they were full of decor. And those eight bins were uh, aside from the outdoor decorations that we had or, or our actual Christmas tree. Now, I have to really underscore here that I did not grow up in a huge house. I had a very modest home. And so eight bins, 10 bins, was too many bins. But anyway, <laughs> every year at the end of November, our house would undergo a transformation. Every surface would be cleared, every wall would be made bare, and all of the furniture would end up in a slightly different configuration to how it usually was. And when that happened, me and my two brothers would prepare ourselves for the request, or it might, you know, more accurately be called an order, to go downstairs and to lug up all of those bins from the basement so that my mother, the Christmas general, could orchestrate the whole operation. It would take us days, literal days, a whole weekend sometimes. We would start on Friday and we would work and work and work and by Sunday night, we might be done. It was a nightmare and it was the best. One of the most exciting things that happened each year was when the last decoration went up. And it wasn't just exciting because it was finally done. It was exciting because it was always the same. A very simple thing that my mom had made. It was this. A cross-stitched wreath with 24 red buttons on it and 24 pouches below. And in each one of those pouches, my mom hid an ornament. And the reason that it was exciting wasn't because each day we got to pull out an ornament and hang it on the wreath. It was exciting because this really became a moment in the day for all of us. It usually happened before school. We would meet at the bottom of the stairs where the wreath was hung and we would see what was next what the new addition to the wreath was going to be. And this moment in the day, it wasn't really about just seeing which ornament was going to go up. It was the same ornaments every single year. We knew what they were. What was so important was that as the wreath got more and more full each day, we knew that we were getting closer and closer to the big day. And our collective excitement grew bit by bit as we pulled out one small, seemingly insignificant thing each day. This tradition came to be the physical reminder of hope in my family. Hanging the ornament each day reminded us that something important was coming. We did this every year, and every single year, the important thing, Christmas Day, actually did arrive. And so the more we did it, this Advent calendar wreath thing, year after year, the more we did it, the more significant this action became. Now, there are a lot of traditions that take place at this time of year. And even if you don't have a lot or if you have sort of been uninterested in participating in holiday traditions for whatever reason, you are likely still to witness some or participate in some or maybe even benefit from some. Maybe you love to listen to Christmas music or maybe from November through December, you just keep the car radio turned off so that you don't have to hear one more rendition of the Mariah Carey classic, All I Want for Christmas is You. 
Maybe you get to see lights going up on houses and apartments and in businesses that you go to or go past. Maybe you like to book time off work because you know there are a bunch of extra stat days built into the bottom half of December, and so you don't have to use as many vacation days to still get that longer time off. Or maybe you know you're about to get a slightly larger paycheck because of all of those time and a half days that are sprinkled in to the end of December. Regardless of your desire to participate in the Christmas season, we do actually live in a place where we have constant reminders that something is about to happen. And we look for, when we look forward, when we look to something that's going to happen in the future, what we're really talking about is hope. Now, this might seem a little bit odd to you. It might seem like that's not really what hope is or how it's used. And if uh, we think about how the word hope is used conversationally, uh, then you would be right. Because there's a bunch of different ways that we use this word hope. And there are two that are conversational that I want to really point out for you. And so the first one is that hope is the desire that we have for something good in the future. So we might say, I hope we can play hockey before supper. And the second one is hope being the reason for thinking that our desire might actually happen. So as an example, we might say, hopefully there's no traffic so that we can get there on time. The way that we use hope in our everyday lives, when we think about it, is actually about uncertainty. Hope, used conversationally, describes uncertainty. Think about it. Think about those examples that I just gave you. When we say, I hope we can play hockey before supper, what we're saying is, I'd like it, but it probably won't happen. Or when we say, hopefully there's no traffic so that we can get there on time, what we're saying is, we want to get there on time, but it might not happen because of this thing that's outside of our control. Um, I think that these uses of hope that explain uncertainty actually track pretty well with some of the hopelessness that we see in the world around us. When we think about a lack of certainty in what the future may hold. Now, I want to spend some time in scripture today. And the one that we're going to spend some time in is the story of Mary, when Mary meets Gabriel. And I think that this uh, this story showcases kind of the opposite of this idea that I just explained, that I just described, this uncertainty. And so we're going to be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1 verses 26 through 28. And as I read it for you, or as you read it for yourself, I want to invite you to notice the little things that the angel says, that Mary says, that add up to make this miraculous story not seem scary, but hopeful. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, who we heard about last week from Tony. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is already in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Right at the beginning of this story, before Jesus even enters into the picture, God makes a request of Mary. And he actually makes some promises to her. When we read this part of the story, we can sometimes breeze through it because we already know the ending. And while I, of course, think that knowing who Jesus is and why he came to earth is very, very important, sometimes, sometimes our knowledge of the ending holds us back from really understanding what is happening in the story that leads to the ending that we are all looking forward to. In this part of the story, we know, and if you don't know, then this is a bit of a spoiler, but we know that Mary is going to be okay. We know it. We've seen it. We've read it. We know that Jesus is born and that all is relatively well. But I want to invite us to pause, if we can, at this point. And I want us to try to see it from Mary's point of view. She was a young woman in a society where young women were not greatly valued except by what they might do once they're married. So Mary's value, according to the world, according to the time and the place where she was living, was established very early in this scripture, in her introduction, where it says that she is a virgin pledged to be married. This tells us that in her context, in the ancient world where she was residing, she was respectable in the eyes of her community. It also tells us that in the eyes of her community, in the eyes of her family, her friends, and everybody that she's actually ever met, she is locked into a relationship with Joseph, a man from the house of David. Now, I have to explain marriage a little bit uh, in ancient Israel because it happened in three separate chunks. So the first one was a suitable mate was sort of chosen. So somebody might say, I've got a daughter, you've got a son. Do you want to see if they kind of connect? And they would meet. And if everything kind of seemed good between the two, then a contract would be written up and it would be signed by both families in the synagogue. It would be signed in front of their community. And at that point, that is when the couple was officially engaged or betrothed. And the third stage was, of course, actually getting married. But it's in this second stage, in this betrothal stage, that we meet Mary. And it's a little bit odd for us to think about now, in 2022, looking back on this custom. Because the engagement phase, the betrothal phase, was used for a few different things. But one of the major purposes of it was to actually ensure that the bride wasn't already pregnant. So this engagement phase could last anywhere from a few weeks up to a full year. And if during this time the woman was found to be pregnant, she was treated as an adulteress. The punishment for that was being stoned. This was a punishment that really impacted the woman and sort of was used to vindicate the groom's honor. So just in this one opening line, we learn a lot about Mary. And we see that there is a lot on the line when she agrees to carry and be the mother of the Christ child. So the question that we should ask here with all of this context is why does Mary agree to this? Why does she agree? Why, when she is on the brink of achieving status in her community, of fulfilling the wishes of her parent and securing a good, kind husband from a good family, would she risk a pregnancy that, if discovered, could lead to her death? What did she know 
that allowed her to persevere. Now we know, we know that Mary was a person of great faith. And it is easy for us to say that it was because of her faith that she accepted what the angel said to her. But I think that there's a little bit more to it. I think that there is something a little bit more tangible for us to get a hold of as we read this story. Because you see, Mary didn't just have faith. She had faith that was founded on an understanding of God's work in her life, in the lives of the people around her, and in the lives of her ancestors, in the lives of the people who came before her. And so when the angel appears and delivers the news of her favor in the eyes of God and what that means, he doesn't just say, here's what you should do, do it. He actually gives her some hints. He gives her five future facts And I want us to pay attention because they are future truths, things that haven't happened yet, but they're dependent on knowledge of the past. So the angel here starts by saying that Mary will conceive and bear a son. And this was special news because the arrival of a child is always a blessing. And so Mary, as a Jewish woman in this time, would have been delighted to hear that she was going to conceive and bear a son. But this child, born to a virgin, was not only special, but surprising. And so the angel goes on to say that the child will be called the Son of the Most High. The Son of the Most High is a title. It's used a few times in the Old Testament. And it was a title that was used to signify a person who was especially connected or linked to God. It's a historical title. But in this case, Mary didn't even know this. She would have known the past connotations, but she didn't know that in this case, the title would be a literal one. And Gabriel goes on to say that Jesus will be given the throne of David. David was a historical figure and one who was incredibly important to the Jewish people. He's referred to a lot. And so Mary, hearing that her child was going to sit on the throne of David, would have had a real understanding of what that meant. She was being told that her child was going to be a king who had a legitimate claim to the leadership of the Jewish people. The next thing that the angel says is that he will be the Messiah. That's what it means when we hear the phrase that he will reign over Jacob's descendants. That's not a casual reference. That is saying that the one who the Jewish people have been waiting for since almost the beginning of their story This person who is mentioned by prophets and historians throughout the Old Testament, the one who the Jewish people have been waiting for is about to arrive. And finally, Gabriel says that his kingdom, the kingdom of the coming child, will endure forever. And this is a surprising one as well, because forever, forever, is a time that only God can actually understand. And it is an amount of time that only God can promise. And it was to Mary, through the angel Gabriel, that God first gave this promise of a future that would not end. When we understand all of that context, we can start to see that the request that God made to Mary was more than balanced out by the promises that he made to her. These five promises, these glimpses into the future added up to something much more significant than Mary could have even realized in that miraculous moment. But because her trust in God was so great, because she heard not just the words of the promises, but the meaning behind them, she responded with hope. I want you to remember that when we use the word hope nowadays, we're describing uncertainty. But biblical hope, 
The hope that we see on display in this story is not just a desire or a want for something in the future. Biblical hope, the hope that we actually continue to have today, is a confident expectation that something good will happen. I want to say that again because I think that it's really important. Biblical hope is a confident expectation that something good will happen. It's not based on nothing. It's based on God's consistent presence. Let me explain a little bit more. Biblical hope can be seen throughout the Bible. And it was really the ancient Jewish tradition that hope was not an objective assessment. The people that we read about in the Bible didn't look around at their lives and say, I have enough food, my friends and family are well, my housing is secured, I'm employed. And because of all of those securities, because everything is going really well, I have hope that the future will also be good. Most of the people that we read about in the Bible didn't have any or even all any, all, none uh, of these things. We really just have to look at Jesus to see this clearly. He was the embodiment of hope. And yet he was hungry a lot of the time. His friends and his family were in constant danger just because of their association to him. And Jesus himself said that the son of man has no place to lay his head. So where does this hope come from? Where does hope come from? The hope that we read about in the Bible, the hope that Mary exhibited is experiential. People looked back over their lives and if there was proof of God's presence in their history, in their backstory, then they would say they would be expectant for God's presence in their future. The angel who visits Mary references the history of Israel as he speaks to her, and he does it in order to help her remember who is making these promises. It's a God who has, throughout the history of her people, come through fulfilled promises. And this is why if you spend a little bit of time reading your Bible, um, you'll start to see how regularly the past is referenced. In the Old Testament, people are always saying, the Lord our God who brought us out of slavery in Egypt, right? They're referencing something that God did, something concrete that he managed. And in the New Testament, people are always referring back to the resurrection of Jesus after it, of course, happens. Now, these aren't casual references. What the ancient Israelites were doing, what they did constantly, was sow reminders of hope into their daily lives, into their everyday conversations, into their prayers and their thoughts. Hope, when it is founded on the confident expectation of God's continued action in our lives, is kind of like a safety net. Its presence encourages us to take risks, not cavalierly, not casually, but with humility, like Mary, when she initially responds to the angel by asking a question in wonder, and then says that she is a servant of the Lord. And she accepts the risk of pregnancy and parenting Jesus. And here's where I want us to look a little bit beyond the specifics of the story that we're reading today because we are not in the same place that Mary was. Our placement in the story should actually give us hope beyond nearly anything that we read in the Bible because our hope is not about something that might happen. Our hope is based in the fact that we already know that the God who created the universe is all in. The God who we serve has already come more than halfway to us. And we know that because we're celebrating Advent. We are commemorating the birth of Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. 
And because of Jesus' arrival, we know with absolute certainty that God's promise never fails. Because of Jesus, hope is guaranteed. And this is why we retell this story year after year. This is why every time we take the chance to light a candle or sing a carol, speak a prayer, or even hang an ornament, we are participating in all of the little things that add up to something that is so much bigger than we could ever realize. We are participating in the story that God is telling. And it requires us to have a forward-looking attitude and a future-focused vision, and it's secure because of the person of Jesus. Jesus, who came to this world in the most impossible way so that we could all point to him and say to ourselves, to each other, and to anybody else who will listen, him, it's him, right there, Jesus. He is the reason that I have hope. We all have the same stories that Mary did. Plus, we have the story of Jesus, of his birth, yes, but of his life, death, and resurrection. Plus, we have another 2,000 years of stories of God's actions. And it all starts here, in the Advent story, in the story of Christmas. I want us to have a little bit of time to think about this before we run out of here um, and hopefully start to sow some hope into our collective daily lives. And so today's reflection uh, exercise is going to look like this. I want you to think about a tradition that you or your family has. And I want you to think about not just what it is, but why it's important. Or if you'd like, or if you have one of these stories, I want you to think about a time where you received an answer to prayer, a moment in your life where, like Mary, you encountered God in a tangible, real way. All right, everybody, welcome back. Uh, If you're still writing a little bit or still have some more thoughts, you can always stick them up later. Um, But before we go, I just want to give you kind of two practical tips, uh, two practical activities, if you will, that will hopefully help you sow some hope into your everyday life. And they're just ideas. You don't have to do them. I have no way to like force you into doing these things, but they are things that I have found to be helpful in my own life. So I'm going to give you two tips and then a quick blessing and, uh, I think it'll be time for our 30 minute parties. All right, so my first uh, tip, if you will, is to remember the significance of small things. I want you to remember that little things add up to big things. And so for the next little while, whether you choose for that to be from today to Christmas, today till the end of the calendar year, um, I wanna encourage you to think about something small that you can do every day. And, you know, it doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be something big, but something small that you can do that will add to the bigger story of faith that God is trying to do in you and through you. So some practical ideas, some like tips. Um, Could you pray for two minutes? Just while you're brushing your teeth. Hopefully you're doing that every day. So while you brush your teeth for two minutes, can you pray? Can you commit to that? Can you commit to getting into the word of God every day? Not for a long time, just for a little bit of time. Maybe you want to jump into the daily readings that we as the well community are doing together. You don't have to comment. You don't have to type anything in. But can you get into the word of God every day for the next little while? Or could you text somebody? Could you send a quick text to somebody who won't be expecting it and send it just because? Just to brighten their day and say hello. Or is there something else small that you can do that will, again, add a little bit to the story of faith that God is writing? And the second thing, and this one might be a little bit more of a commitment, not the two-minute teeth brushing tip, but something maybe a little bit bigger. I want you to create a spot for reminders of hope 
to live. Now, this could be a notebook, it could be a list that lives on your wall, it could be a jar where you can, you know, pop notes into. But I want you to think about creating a spot somewhere in your space where hope can live. We as a human species are sort of hardwired to only remember the bad. And some, you know, scientists say that it's an evolutionary thing so that we are able to, like, avoid danger and survive as a species. But what this kind of hardwiring does is it actually makes it really challenging for us to look back and remember all the good. Now, you might remember some of those like big good moments, like maybe you have a, a birthday that particularly stands out. Or if you're married, I hope that you have some good memories of your wedding day. Or maybe you got some wonderful news. Maybe there's an illness that went into remission or was cured, and that really stands out for you. Or maybe, like Mary, in our story that we talked about today, you have a moment where you were certain that you encountered God, and that shines bright in your mind's eye. But that is not the case for all of the little things that happen. And so we need to be kind of overtly extra in acknowledging and tracking all of the good things that happen. So I want you to spend some time, if you want to, again, I'm not mandating this, but on your own or with a friend or with your family, I want you to talk through and write down all of the good things that have happened in your life, all of the ways in which God has shown up for you in the past and and some of the ways that he's showing up for you in the present. And again, I want you to keep this list, this notebook, this jar, somewhere where you can continue to add to it. Because hope is a tonic, right? It's a tonic in the midst of an impossible circumstance. And someday, something really difficult, something really tough might happen. And when it does, you might not actually feel like you can see God in that circumstance or in that situation. And when that happens, if that happens, you might need some hard proof, some evidence of God's actions in your life. You might need some proof that he has been there so that you can remember that he is there and that he will be there. So those are my two sort of tips or takeaways, practical things that you can do to sow hope into your own daily life and existence. And if I can, I would just love to offer you a word of blessing as we wrap up our time together. So if you will, open your hands and receive this. Um, You can keep them closed too, whatever feels most comfortable to you. Lord, help us to remember that the little things add up to big ones whether they are small things like the ornaments on the advent wreath in my home or big things like these signs that were blank and after four weeks are covered in our confident expectations, in our hope for you, Jesus. God, I thank you for each person who is gathered here and I pray that they encounter you, Lord Jesus, as they go from this place and anticipate the coming Christmas day. Amen.